Olá, bom dia a todos e todas. Estamos aqui com a quarta conferência com o professor André Amarati. O... Estamos online? Estamos online. O professor... Agora começarei a fazer a introdução em português para posteriormente fazer a introdução do professor em inglês. Para posteri... Em seguida, abrir o palco para ele. O professor André Amarati é pós-doutorando na Universidade de Bari e professor de Antropologia da Alimentação na Universidade de Bolonha. Os seus interesses de investigação centram-se principalmente na história da alimentação e na história da magia na época medieval. Entre suas principais publicações mais recentes estão Becoming a Witch, Woman and Magic in Europe During Middle Ages and Beyond, lançado neste ano, e Food and Culture in Medieval Scandinavia, lançado no ano passado. O professor Marati colabora com o Centro Interuniversitário de Pesquisa Seminário de História de la Ciência da Universidade de Bari e com a Società de Estudi Valdense. Ele é membro do Centro Interdepartamental de Pesquisa Tibo in Salute, Nutracéutica, Nutrigenômica, Nutribiótica Intestinale, Agricultura e Benedicite Sociale, também da Universidade de Bari. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to introduce the professor Andrea Marachi. He's gonna, I'm going to introduce him first, then I'm going to open the floor to him to make his uh, conferences. Uh, Andrea Marachi is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Bari and a lecturer of anthropology of food at the University of Bologna. His research uh, interest mainly focuses on the history of food and in the history of the magic in medieval times. Among his most recent publications are Becoming a Witch, Woman and Magic in Europe During the Middle Ages and Beyond, and Food Culture in Medieval Scandinavia. He collaborates with the Interuniversity Research Center, Seminario di Storia uh, della Scienza, of the University of Bari, and with the Società di Studi Vadenzi. He is a member of the Interdepartmental, Interdepartmental Central Research, Tibo in Salute, Nutraceutica, Nutrigenomica, Microbiotica Intestinale, Agricultura e Benedicite Sociale of the University of Bari. Now I'm going to open the floor for the professor to make his uh, uh, conference. Thank you so much for your time. Andrea, the floor is yours. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, waking up and, and joining us here. Thanks a lot, uh, Andre, for your uh, kind uh, introduction. It's, uh, it's an honor to uh, having been invited to, to join you for this beautiful um, conference. And a special thanks, if I may, to Professor Johnny Langer, who uh, contacted me personally uh, a few months ago to ask me to, to talk with you about um, about uh, Ragnarok uh, specifically. So I guess you can already uh, see my my screen here, my presentation. And for the topic of today, I decided to approach the theme, the topic of Ragnarok from a different perspective than usual. And uh, I hope that can be interesting for, for you all. I know that many of you are uh, interested in uh, medievalisms, so in uh, modern, and contemporary receptions of uh, everything medieval. And that's exactly what uh, we're going to do for the next um, uh, hour or, or so. So I'm going to uh, address Ragnarok from, from the perspective of myth, uh, history, and specifically medievalisms. Because I believe that um, Ragnarok can be quite relevant for us all nowadays, uh, since we are going through uh, times of, uh, of climate change and global warming. So. We're, we're living in an age where this macro topic, um, you know, is is very like, like it's an everyday topic for us all. It's something that um, preoccupies us on a daily basis. And maybe looking back at these uh, more ancient stories uh, can maybe help us understand a little bit of what um, expects us in the future. Maybe that's that's what I'm trying to suggest uh, nowadays. In the, um, with this lecture, with this talk. So, uh, when I started, when I start usually, start my studies of uh, 
Scandinavian related things, uh, I often, very often, comes across Jorge Luis Vargas, uh, an author that I believe you are very familiar with as well. Uh, not only because he was a great poet, but also because he was very interested in Old Norse mythology. He himself visited Iceland in, I believe, the 1960s. And uh, he uh, held that Icelanders were basically the inventors of romance, uh, referring to, to, to the sagas, of course. And he wrote beautiful poems about some themes uh, regarding, uh, regarding Old Norse mythology. And among others, he wrote this beautiful one. Um, this is just a, a, a tiny passage, of course, of a poem uh, entitled Midgat Urmur, of course, in reference to the uh, cosmogonic serpent that uh, on Ragnarok would destroy, uh, would, would ignore uh, the uh, uh, roots of Yggdrasil and then would destroy, would poison the ocean, the sea, and would be one of the protagonists of the destruction of the world and of the gods. And he talks about this unconceivable shadow looming over the earth. And he, as you can see, he talks about a terra pallida, so a pale earth. Earth is pale because the light over earth is actually pale, because that is not just a random day, but that is the day, the altos lobos, the, of the high wolves. It is the day of high wolves. Uh, of course, we all we are we are all familiar with with Fenrir and, or Skoll, and um, on that day we all know what happens. And Vargas talks about a splendid, terrible agony uh, looming and falling on Earth, and uh, basically casting a perpetual twilight, a twilight that he says que uh, no se nombra. It's so terrible you cannot even name it. So we could just conclude that, uh, you know, Vargas was just so gifted that he could uh, make this myth beautiful to, to us, uh, even uh, in our contemporary days. But the reality is that, yes, he was very gifted, but this myth is also very, very powerful. The core of it is so potent that it's not surprising, in my opinion, that it still resonates, still echoes in our time. So... Uh, fair play to, to, to Borges, but we also have to recognize the value of the Ragnarok myth as a beautiful, even though very sad story. But you may have noticed that I chose a spelling specifically. I chose to use uh, Ragnaroker, uh, which um, according to Haraldur Bernarsson, who wrote an interesting article a few, a few years ago about, about this, um, the very spelling Ragnaroker, which we find in Snorraeda, uh, doesn't merely signify twilight of the gods, but also hints at the rebirth. And this is the like dual, you know, lane I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, take with you today. So on the one side we are gonna talk about destruction, but on the other side we also gonna address the idea of rebirth, which is technically uh, imbued fixed in the uh, myth of Ragnarok. Okay, so we all know where to find information about, about the Ragnarok myth in, uh, in the Old Norse corpus. So firstly and foremost, the Elder Edda, and in three poems uh, specifically, so Völuspa, Vafthrutismal, and uh, Völuspa in Skama, so Hindu Yod. And of course, Snorri in the 2020s, 1220s, sorry, uh, you know, drew upon this uh, corpus and uh, try to respect this tradition. He, of course, added a little bit of a Christian filter, Christian bias, but all in all, he was very, very respectful of what he found in this older corpus of poems. So, uh, actually, these two branches of the story are very consistent with each other. And so, according to the story, but again, we all know about it. Um, so, what happens? Um, on the very day of uh, Baldur's uh, death. So we know that Fenrir, you know, gets free from his magical uh, chains. And the first thing he does is swallowing the sun. 
So the destruction of the universe, of the world, starts with an act of eating, which is very interesting. So he and uh, another wolf, they eat the sun, the moon, the stars. So darkness falls on earth. And as a logical consequence, and I'm stressing the word logical, I will get back to it later. What happens on the world? Well, of course, darkness, uh, temperatures decrease considerably, uh, a thick you know, frost, uh, um, you know, covers uh, the, the earth and a perpetual winter, female weather, you know, starts and the cycle of season is, is broken, is interrupted. And as a consequence of this, uh, society collapses. Uh, brothers kill brothers, sons kill parents. So it's a dreadful uh, picture of the end of the world. But as you know, uh, there's... Um, like a spark of hope at the end of the story, because as the world is falling over, two human beings, Leif and Leif Therzir, uh, are able to uh, to hide in uh, Odmimir's woods. And uh, they're going to wait until the Fimble winter, the Fimble weather is over, and they feed only on uh, morning dew, morning dog. And then uh, after the winter, they, uh, you know, leave the woods and they start civilization over again so this is a beautiful story the steel is so potent even in our days and i will try to to show you why and and how so let's address some medievalisms concerning this myth so literally the shadows cast by these high wolves cast in in our very days so here we are dealing with a myth, a myth which, as many others, uh, is, again, dense with symbolism, with strong symbolism. But what was the purpose of stories such as this one in for past societies and so for, for the Germanic and Scandinavian peoples? Um, you know, one of the main issues that these ancient societies had and that we tend to forget nowadays is that they needed to find explanations to what happened around them. This is, may sound as a banal thing to note, but believe me, it's not. Uh, we are very lucky. We live in a society uh, that is the you know, direct descendant of modern science. So science to us explains a lot happening around us. It gives meaning to uh, what we can witness. It gives us explanations and it's quite logical, we can learn it. Uh, so we are reassured by modern science. That's our way of understanding the world. And some might say, for obvious reasons, that, it, that it's the correct way to understand uh, natural phenomena or catastrophes of that kind. But here I'm not interested in, in, in stating what is wrong, what is right. I'm just saying that in the past, people had other resources to understand what was going on around them. So how to make, how to bring order to chaos, how to explain when, for example, a natural catastrophes hit your society, hit your environment, how to explain that? You gotta find an explanation, you gotta find an answer for your generation and for generations to come. You need that in order to survive, literally to survive. You need to find ways to uh, like overcome the sense of danger, otherwise you would really collapse. And I believe that this was one of the main functions of myths in the past, to find explanations, to make sense of natural events, or even to more ordinary things like the cycle of seasons. Think about the myths like Persephone or Demetra. You know, th those myths just explain the, the cycle of seasons. But other myths explained uh, how to cope and how to explain natural catastrophes or natural events. So the Ragnarok myth might be something like this, but there's also something else about these myths. Not only they explained how to cope with these catastrophes, but they also made sure to fix an important message for future generations. They warned against hubris, uh, in English, arrogance, pride. Many of these stories about apocalypses uh, you know, bring a strong message with them. Don't ever think that you are untouchable. Don't ever think that you are in control of what happens around you. 
don't be like Daedalus and Icarus uh, here in this uh, painting, Icarus, uh, namely. Um, so hubris is one of the uh, main dangers that uh, human beings keep, you know, um, committing in generations. And I believe this is one of the main things about the Ragnarok myth as well. Now, there's many, many references, even uh, starting from the 19th century onward, to the Ragnarok myth for obvious reasons. We all know uh, the kind of cultural context that uh, took shape uh, during the Romanticism, so Victorian times in the 19th century, etc., uh, etc. Et I will just make a few examples that I find more meaningful than others. So forgive me for for omitting uh, others. All right. So um, I believe that a beautiful medievalism of the Ragnarok myth is proposed by Hans Christian Andersen, who was one of the protagonists of the um, so-called Third Revolution in the uh, story uh, of uh, and in the evolution of fairy tales, because in his age, fairy tales were uh, pretty much, uh, you know, separated into into two branches. So at that point, we have, uh, you know, stories for adult people and story for children, and that was not uh, uh, that didn't happen until his very times. So he, uh, among the others, he wrote uh, in 1858 uh, a um, fairy tale entitled The Marsh King's Daughter. You may have heard of a recent movie with this same title, which has been loosely, loosely inspired by this fairy tale, but actually it's very, very different. So um, don't uh, watch the movie if you want to find more about Ragnarok uh, in this story. You, you, you should read the story instead. All right, so um, this is a very complex story, by the way, so I can't really go through it. But to make a long story short, uh, the main protagonist here is a young a uh, girl named uh, Helga. Helga is literally the daughter of two supernatural beings, one of them being the evil Marsh King. And another one, her, her mother is a, an Egyptian princess. But in fact, Helga is raised by um, two other people uh, who happen to be two Vikings, so-called Vikings. So we don't really know much more about them, we just know that they worship the Norse gods and that the um, husband in this couple, you know, is a proper Viking in the sense that he's a pirate. So, and he pillages other villages. So Helga is raised by, by them, but she has been bewitched. She has been bewitched by uh, her father, pretty much. And uh, her curse makes her live a very very weird life because she's she assumes two different shapes so during the day she is a normal girl but she's merciless very cruel she can't feel compassion during the night she turns into a toad but she is very compassionate she is very kind and there's one only way in which she can free herself from this curse and is to feel compassion during the day. But that's very hard because that's the point of, of her curse. So the story basically uh, orbits around uh, Helga's uh, attempt to um, escape her bewitchment. By the way, uh, her mother as well uh, has also been cursed and she can't escape the marsh. So very, very complex story. But anyways, so Helga meets a Christian priest. So this Christian priest was held captive by uh, her uh, father, her Viking father, because you know, as I said, her father was was a was a pillager, and uh, uh, during one of his uh, um, expeditions, he held captive a this Christian priest, brought it home, and he uh, wanted to sacrifice him to to the Norse gods. But when Helga was in the shape of a toad, felt very sorry about this very sad destiny or destiny of uh, the christian priest so she decides to uh, free him to help uh, him to escape um, as a matter of fact he escapes and promises her that the christian god would help her to uh you know abandon her curse to 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 be released from her bewitchment um so in fact, the two, Helga and the Christian priest, develop a very positive relationship. But unfortunately, the Christian priest is killed almost immediately after he has run from the Viking family. 
and Helga for the first time feels very, very sorrow and painful for uh, his friend. And he felt sorrow in the form of a toad, but also in the form of a girl. And so now she's free and she's a normal girl once again. She feels compassion even when she's in the form of a girl. So problem solved. But there's um, a consequence about this because Hans Christian Andersen, of course, he, he was a Christian, uh, even though his uh, relationship with Christianity and faith was a little bit uh, peculiar. Um, I'm not going to delve into, into this now, but uh, he was surely Christian. And this is a story of conversion, in fact, because later in the fairy tale, uh, we find out that this is exactly his aim. His story it aims at um, showing the reader how the Norse people uh, reacted when they faced Christian, the Christian faith, when the Christian faith spread, uh, you know, uh, over uh, Scandinavia and, and, and Iceland, and the Nordic lands in general. And this little passage here, which I'm going to read for you, um, speaks specifically of the reaction of the Viking woman, so Helga, uh, step, Helga steps, uh, stepmother, um, if, you, if you want. And um, so th this woman has a, a vision, pretty much. She has a dream. And in this dream, she uh, sees Ragnarok. But it's very interesting the way that Christian Andersen, uh, um, you know, employs Ragnarok as a story of conversion. So let, let's read through it. So the Viking's wife thought of all the miracles she had heard were performed by the white Christ, so by the Christian Christ, and by those who had the faith to follow him. She had heard that because, of course, the Vikings, the so-called Vikings, were already in contact with Christians, so they captured them, but still they, they heard stories uh, of miracles. So her troubled thoughts gave way to dreams, so she starts dreaming. And this is a dream, so a storm blew up. To the east and to the west, she heard the high seas roll waves of the North Sea and waves of the Kattegat. The great snake, which in the depth of the ocean coils around the earth, was in convulsions of terror. It was the twilight of the gods, Ragnarok, as the heathens called Judgment Day, when all would perish, even their highest gods. The war horn sounded, and over the rainbow bridge the gods rode, clad in steel, to fight they lost a great fight. The winged Valkyries charged on, charged on before them, and dead heroes marched behind. The whole firmament blazed with the northern lights, yet darkness conquered in the end. That's a beautiful description of what happens during Ragnarok. It was an awful hour. The air resounded with the clashing of swords and clubs, and a rattle of arrows like a hailstorm upon the roof. The hour had come when heaven and earth would perish, the stars would fall, and everything would be swallowed up by pseudo sea of fire. So until this point, this is a beautiful, though terrible, description of destruction. But look at the last two sentences. Yet, she knew there would be a new heaven and a new earth. The grain would grow in waving fields where the sea now rolled over the golden sand. So the message that Hans Christian Andersen wanted to convey to the reader is that that's how a Viking gets converted, right? He or she gets in contact with Christians, so they hear their stories. At some point, they have to face their Ragnarok, but at that point, their Ragnarok is not the end of the world, but it's the end of their world, their Norse pagan world. So... Uh, this is, uh, I think, a very uh, crafty use of the Ragnarok myth to talk about the end of something and the beginning of something else, which uh, Hans Christian Andersen, for obvious rhetorical reasons, uh, deems better. So it's a better uh, age for human beings if it's a Christian age, pretty much, with all due respect for, for the Norse past, of course. So if we keep talking about the 19th century, so there will be so many other examples. I'm not an expert of 19th century medievalism, so uh, I'm not going to delve into it too long. Uh, I just wanted to recall what Brian Stock writes in his uh, book, Listening for a Text, where I believe he summarizes very uh, 
elegantly. What's the point here? So he writes that the Renaissance invented the Middle Ages in order to define itself. And of course, in contrast to the so-called Middle Ages that, you know, um, that separated this beautiful age of Renaissance from the previous golden age of the Roman Empire. The Enlightenment perpetuated them in order to admire itself because, uh, you know, uh, Enlightenment intellectuals believed that the Middle Ages were just a superstitious and a little bit barbaric age, you know, um, that believed in religion more than, than anything else. And, and for this very reason, the Romantics revived the Middle Ages in, in order to escape from themselves. So the Romantics, just because the Middle Ages were thought to be very superstitious, very religious, and also because they were characterized stereotypically by, by you know, an environment where nature uh, thrived, uh, over civilization that uh, sounded very, uh, very sexy to them, you know, very cool to them. So Brian Stock says that the Middle Ages thus constituted one of the most prevalent cultural myths of the modern world. And uh, we can, I believe we can all agree with them. In fact, during the 19th century in many continental uh, states in Europe, like uh, of course, the Scandinavian countries and Germany and France, uh, you know, the, the Norse myth and the medieval era in general uh, were very instrumental to build these nations' very identity. So in a time of uh, where identities, national identities were being crafted, uh, resorting to these whole old stories uh, was very useful. So new ideas of the barbarians were, were crafted uh, just to um, uh, do a propaganda political propaganda uh, to these uh, political discourses and um, politics aside we gotta we gotta admit that uh, uh, that whole cultural milieu uh, produced uh, nice uh, masterpieces we all know we're all familiar with Freud's uh, Ragnarok Friesen which was intended to be a frieze of you know retelling the story of all the all Norse mythological corpus but then due to obvious uh, space-related limits uh, at uh, Christian Borg Palace, they decided, uh, Freund decided to uh, tell only the Ragnarok myth. So this is a beautiful frieze that, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we can still uh, admire nowadays. And specifically here we have a scene of Mimer and Balder on, on the right questioning the Norse center. And on the left you can see uh, three uh, Valkyrie. Uh, what's interesting about these uh, frieze is that you can still see that these Norse gods use uh, Greek or classical uh, clothes. So it was still a phase of transition between the use of Norse gods, Germanic gods, and the use of uh, classical uh, references like clothes, for example. We're all familiar with Richard Wagner's uh, Güterdamerung, which is exactly a uh, reference to the Twilight of the Gods, uh, to the Ragnar myth, this beautiful fourth music uh, drama. And we also know that uh, uh, Wagner's costume designer was very influential in, you know, uh, throwing this idea of, of perpetuating this idea of, uh, uh, you know, these helmets, typical, stereotypical uh, helmets, Viking helmets with uh, wings and of, uh, you know, dragons or birds. So, uh, you know, it's it's out of this i mean of course the, this uh, in this age of many masterpieces were produced inspired by the ragnarok myth because i believe that story is so potent and in fact we can also uh, talk about we can also see a sort of um you know a beautiful story inspiring great artists in the 19th century which in turn who in turn inspired other artists uh, later uh, in the following century. For example, speaking of Wagner's Götterdämmerung, um, we, you may, for, uh, you may remember that in Francis Ford Coppola's uh, movie, very famous one, Apocalypse Now, note the title, uh, it refers to an apocalypse, but specifically to the Vietnam War, uh, the director chooses to use uh, Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries um, in one of those uh, very, uh, epic scenes of uh, American helicopters storming over uh, Vietnamese uh, forests and using uh, napalm to destroy them. So that's a, a very 
uh, you know, efficient way of using Wagner's uh, potent uh, sounds and and um, and work. So, to some extent, Ragnarok, the Ragnarok myth, was so powerful that inspired masterpieces, and these masterpieces uh, inspired other um, uh, masterpieces, even within the context of uh, cinema and uh, and more. So, this uh, interplay of uh, references and citations is is very uh, interesting. Uh, and this is also to 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 say that there's many facets to the notion of apocalypse. There's many kinds of apocalypse, not only an apocalypse regarding um, a great winter, not only an apocalypse regarding the destruction of gods, but also modern apocalypses such as this one, such as wars. And um, so basically we could you could say that every age, every society unfortunately had their own apocalypses ours included and so let's talk about us this this is what i'm really interested interested in nowadays so we are i believe in an age of um a revival of everything viking so being viking using this label is very cool especially on the internet um for some reason uh, you may have noticed uh, um, these sorts of advertisements that were very popular until at least a couple of years ago um, in, on Facebook. And um, uh, by the way, so, sorry for the traffic on the, on the background. My neighbor uh, is uh, is uh, pretty noisy at this time of the day. Um, anyways, so you, you may have noticed these advertisements uh, very popular on, um, on Facebook. And um, I think they, they, they are... They attest to a certain Germanophilia or other days, or at least a Viking philia to some extent, because I find it very funny how these advertisements uh, refer to Viking DNA, uh, whatever that means. Uh, Viking, as you know, it does not refer to any ethnic group, at best to several different ethnic groups, but more specifically, the word Viking means refers to a profession, to the profession of being a pirate so there's no such thing as a viking dna but of course um this sounds cool and it's very um effective if you want to uh, sell a service like this one so this became very popular and uh, <clears throat> it it caught my attention because we are constantly captivated by by the past you may have heard in these very days like last week uh, that on tiktok there was a trend that i believe there was on tiktok there was a trend uh, uh, referring to, you know, men all over the world thinking constantly to the Roman Empire. Um, but, to, I mean, surprisingly, I've got to say, there's no DNA test that asks you if you want to know more about your Roman ancestry, as far as I could see. So uh, apparently many people are, are obsessed with the Roman Empire nowadays, uh, at least many men according to TikTok. Uh, but uh, as far as DNA tests go, um, I think that the, uh, Viking DNA tests are way more popular, maybe because they, I don't know, they intersect the interests of uh, um, users of, of Facebook, maybe. So everything Viking is cool nowadays. And this can also mean that you can make a very bad, bad use of the past. So this is just a, a digression. I'm going to get back to the Ragnarok a myth in a moment, but this is just to to show you uh, that the past can be used uh, more or less, you know, harmlessly, but it can also be weaponized. And especially old Norse mythology can be weaponized, and it was weaponized very recently. You may remember uh, what happened on January the 6th, 2021, during the assault of Chapel Hill. You may remember this guy here, Jacob Angeli Chainsley, who um, um, I'm not very proud to 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 remind that uh, I think he has Italian origins, so we share uh, we have a common origin, and um, so you, you may remember that um, he made many references to Vikings and to all Norse mythology, of course, to distorted ideas of this. Uh, needless to say, and look at his at his tattoos, for example, he shows uh, very proud, proudly, uh, you know, Thor's hammer, uh, Mjölder, on the left inferior side of his abdomen, and just um, above it, there uh, is a tattoo 
uh, concerning uh, Yggdrasil. Um, and we, we all know what these, what is the political ideas that these people, uh, you know, support. We all know that these uh, are, uh, you know, in some cases, these right-wing, um, you know, activists um, are white supremacists and all that. So this is, of course, a very, very bad use of the past. And that's why we should always be very careful with our students as well on how we teach them uh, the very meaningful, the true meaning of this uh, story in, in order not to let them uh, distort this, this story and this, and this myth. But for that matter, it might not surprise you that when Donald Trump himself, who is supported by some of those activists, um, was elected, so I remember this was 2015, 2016, um, it turned out that uh, he had Viking origins, or anyways, that he has, uh, you know, some uh, shared origins with um, Norwegian and Danish and Icelandic royalties. Sorry for the plane uh, in the background. And uh, one of the reasons behind this, of course, is that his mother is from uh, an island in Scotland, which I believe is in the Hebrides. Uh, so that, that was one of the reasons behind this uh, theory. But I found it very interesting that, uh, uh, you know, the very political figure which is supported by, you know, the likes of Jacob Chainsley Angeli has also been associated to Viking origins, whatever this uh, label Viking means to these people, of course. Yeah, actually, they kind of look uh, like each other. So <laughs> Donald Trump was said to uh, be related either to uh, King Röriker or uh, Rurik uh, or to King um, Hakon V Magnusson in this case. So, yeah, I mean, they look like each other to some extent, but, okay, uh, aside from joking, let's get back to, to Ragnarok. So let's try and make a good use or an interesting use of this storism and of the Old Norse corpus of sources. So... I find it very interesting what has happened in the last 10 to 15 years. I noticed that uh, the way that people, artists uh, or directors uh, made of the Ragnarok story uh, tells a lot about the age we're living in. So the first example I want to make is a beautiful uh, novel uh, published by Antonia Bayat in 2011 and entitled Ragnarok, The End of the Gods. It's a beautiful novel because it is a story of a young girl during the Second World War whose father has been enrolled by the British Army. He's a pilot. So this girl, uh, you know, needs to move to another house and, of course, uh, goes through a very bad and troublesome experience, as you as you may imagine. And in, in her new house, she finds a book and this book is um, a retelling, I don't remember if it's the Edda or a retelling probably of uh, Old Norse uh, myths. So she reads uh, this book and she lives a twofold experience at that point. So she um, reinterprets uh, her actual reality of the Second World War with all the, uh, you know, uh, terrible aspects of that uh, tragic event. He he lives this experience on the basis of she reads in uh, the Old Norse uh, mythology. So he uses she uses the myths to make sense of what's happening around her. Exactly what I told you about Ragnarok uh, at the beginning of, of this talk. So this beautiful novel is a is a way to suggest that storytelling can be a means to cope with uh, adversities and to find meaning in a chaotic chaotic world. And Antonia Bayat is, um, to her own admission, very pessimistic about our reality, our world nowadays. This is a, a, a you know, a little passage, a short passage from an interview she released during the Edinburgh International Book uh, Festival in 2011, where she stated, uh, I am a profound pessimist, both about life and about uh, human relations and about politics and ecology. Humans uh, are inadequate and stupid creatures who sooner or later make a mess. We are into the world of Ragnarok, where whatever we do, we cannot stop the doom that is coming. 
And I found her words, um, aside from her pessimistic stance, which is respectable, but I want to focus my attention and your attention on that sentence, we are into the world of Ragnarok. So she is convinced that the Ragnarok myth, to some extent, in its own, in its own way, um, speaks about us. It's not just something from the past that just, you know, looks good, sounds good, is, you know, beautiful, is, is a beautiful reading, but that's it. No, it still is very relevant to us. I'm gonna deal with this aspect again during the conclusions of this talk. Now, um, you may be all familiar with the, the uh, very famous uh, series of Vikings, which by no means is uh, a respectful or at least philological correct. Uh, probably that's not uh, the director's purpose either. Uh, so it has many, many flaws uh, without a doubt. But in during the first season, episode six, entitled Burial of the Dead, uh, broadcasted on April the 7th, 2013, I think that the director kind of nailed it concerning the function of myths and the meaning of Ragnarok uh, to a society like, like that. Okay, so the context around that episode is that Ragnar and um, his uh, man had just, uh, if I remember correctly, come back from uh, Lindisfarne, uh, which they pillaged, of course, and they broke brought back with them uh, the monk, the Christian monk Athelstan. Now Athelstan, uh, you know, is treated quite respectfully by Ragnar, but not as much from the other members of that community. And for obvious reasons, because he's not like them. He's other. He's a marginalized subject. And at some point in episode six, this is what Atherston tells Ragnar. So they are sitting around the same table. They all have great deep complicity among themselves, ex uh, uh, except for Atherston. So Atherston pretty much sits alongside them, but he's not really part of what's going on. Is not really with them. But he finds the courage to ask this question. Uh, Ragnar, I've heard many of your stories, but tell me, what is Ragnarok? I've heard mention of it several times, but so far no one has explained the meaning to me. Now, this is just, you know, a retelling of something that might have occurred, or simply just a, a fictional reinterpretation of, uh, you know, of communities of uh, Norse people and of their relationship with with Christian subjects. So this is not like this is not history, but it doesn't mean that we can't find uh, it useful to reflect uh, upon uh, all Norse mythology. So what we get from this passage is that what can be the purpose of a myth? The purpose of a myth is can be among other things to strengthen the identity of a community because a community or a culture, a society, share the story, share the moral values that are imbued and, per and perpetuated in the story. So their identity also are, is based on stories such as this one. And if you don't know the story, you're not a part of the community. That's one of the things that may have uh, been going on when uh, two different societies uh, came into contact. We can't, be really, we can't really be on the same level if we don't know what's really meaningful to us. In particular, Ragnarok here is um, described as not just as a, an important identity marking story, but as a precious secret about the future. What is the secret? The secret is the apocalypse. So it's as if the Norse people like Ragnar and his family and his community know a very important thing that's going to happen in the future. They know it. The Christians don't. So Atherston wanted to, you know, know a little bit more about this story. But their reaction, uh, Ragnar and uh, Ragnar's and uh, his uh, family's reaction at first was, you know, they were not sure they should share that story, that precious story with, with Atherston. 
Because again, that was a very precious teaching about what could happen, what would happen in the future. So they talk with each other and at last they decide that maybe Arthur Stanley is worthy of knowing the story. They share the story with him. And from that moment onward, he becomes slowly, gradually one of them. Um, I want to emphasize this aspect of Ragnarok as a story uh, conveying, a, if, if not a secret, but an essential information about the future, that it's very important to hand down to future generations. So not everybody can, can know it, only the Norse, only us. Then, of course, you know, the internet is a wild place. And you may know the uh, Jorvik Viking Center in York, uh, a respectable institution, a beautiful museum. And, okay, it was it's very cool what happened in 2013, 2014. So you may know that every year uh, uh, during the second or third um, week in February, the Jovic Viking Center uh, arranges a uh, so-called uh, Yolablot, uh, but they don't sacrifice anybody. It's just uh, like an event, a thematic event, uh, which is, um, you know they use to attract attract tourists. And uh, every year they choose a theme. And in 2014, they chose the theme of Ragnarok. So fair enough. The problem is that uh, for uh, you know to to you know make advertisement and to uh, you know, spread the news of this uh, uh, event, the thematic event, they also spread the, the information, the fake information, that experts had found a Viking calendar. Uh, and this Viking calendar, whatever Viking means, by the way, this Viking calendar predicted the end of the world. So Ragnarok. So Ragnarok had a date, and this date was, curiously, on, the, on February 22nd, 2014, which is the day uh, on which uh, the Yola Blot would uh, be um, celebrated, would be arranged, so the day of the uh, festival. Okay, so as you can see, information uh, spread on the internet and many tabloids and magazines um, talked about the coming um, Ragnarok, the coming apocalypse. So the problem was that uh, the Yola Vakin Center said that experts uh, in all Norse mythology, so philologists and uh, historians, maybe even archaeologists, I don't remember, uh, had found this uh, Viking calendar and had uh, decoded it. And so it was true. Uh, but that simply was not the case. And actually, uh, uh, if I'm correct, uh, Gisli Sigurdsson himself, who actually is an expert of these topics, released uh, an interview. Uh, about this, and he said that no, that there was no such calendar, no such Viking calendar, calendar, and this was just mere uh, propaganda. Uh, the problem was, if you want to call it a problem, that those were peculiar years. So I'm not sure if you remember that, but during uh, 2010, 2011, and especially 2012, there was a great fuss on the internet and on the TV news about the end of the world. And um, in that case, it was due to people like um, Graham Hancock, um, but many others actually, who were speaking about this Mayan calendar predicting the end of the world on December the 21st, 2012. So there was actually a great fuss about the end of the world. So a lot of people were talking about this. And just the following year, in 2013, this um, campaign uh, started by the Jovic Mackin Center uh, talking about another end of the world, which the experts uh, found uh, discovered in the sources. So again, it was not uh, like a random time, but it was a time when people were, were used to talk about and to hear stories about um, a so-called apocalypse. So it turned out that on the 22nd of February, 2014, people had uh, you know believed in the story so much so that if you had logged on to Facebook on that very day, uh, you would have found this in the stats of Facebook. This is the trending feed, so the most clicked news. So on the very day when uh, Justin Timberlake and Jimmy Fallon were reteaming for whatever Mr. Rob 
on tonight's show, whatever that was. And on the very day when the most wanted drug lord was captured in Mexico, people were literally smashing the left mouse button uh, in, their, in their rooms, in their houses, to find out more about the end of the world, according to the Vikings. Maybe because people nowadays are prone to believe lots of things that circulate on the internet, especially when they are catastrophic. But the reality is that we like hear stories about catastrophes, do, don't we? We like hear storing stories about catastrophes because as long as we can read them or, or as long as we can watch them, uh, we are reassured because you can like share the troublesome experiences of people going through catastrophe but without actually living them, without actually experience, experiencing them. So that's why these stories are very powerful for us all. Now, there could be many, many other subtle references to Ragnarok in literature, TV series, cinema. Some of them are more subtle, some of them are more like manifest. Uh, some believe that George R. R. Martin uh, drew upon the Ragnarok myth and Fimul Vetter for his beautiful saga, uh, so Game of Thrones um, and his novels, of course, because the whole saga you know, is centered about the idea of the, the threat that winter is coming. So this perpetual winter uh, coming from beyond the Great Wall. And, um, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I've never found any like interview or any specific uh, statement where Martin uh, declares, states that uh, he uh, actually drew upon the Fimbulvetter myth or the Ragnarok myth for that matter. But it may simply, uh, you know, uh, you know, find ins found inspiration, but, that, but that's it. Um, we, we are pretty sure that uh, he, he knows uh, Olnos mythology quite well, so much so that he, that he might have found inspiration from all Norse material uh, to, for example, um, you know, craft the White Walkers. Uh, these entities which would come back from uh, death, basically, uh, and who live um, beyond the, the Great Wall. And they look like, in terms of their characteristics, they look like Draugr. But again, I, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with any uh, statement by Martin about his source of inspiration. Some people say that the Three-Eyed Raven in, uh, in Game of Thrones can be a reference to Odin's uh, ravens. But again, this is just, just speculation. I, we can just uh, safely assume that the topic of a perpetual winter is very effective within the context of Game of Thrones and of those um, stories for obvious reasons. But for that matter, we can go on and on and find other references which do not necessarily uh, uh, reflect uh, Ragnarok. Perpetual winters are a threat. So a threat always works within uh, you know, stories such as this ones. For example, we have the White Witch um, uh, Jadis in, in, uh, in Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Again, a perpetual winter, uh, but, but we, I'm not aware of any, of any specific reference to, to Ragnarok. But for that matter, even Frozen has a perpetual winter at some point. And by the way, Frozen has been inspired by a, um, uh, a fairy tale by, by Anderson, very, very loosely inspired, actually, by Anderson Sneedroningen. But again, uh, you know, perpetual winters just are perfect for stories um, uh, for many, many reasons. Um, we can definitely find more specific references to Ragnarok and to Finn Mulvetter elsewhere. Here, for example. Um, so I'm not a fan of the Marvel Universe, but I believe that if we are interested in the Ragnarok myth and its in uh, its modern receptions, we can't omit, um, you know, the Marvel Universe. We can't omit the Marvel comics and then the Marvel cinematic uh, transpositions. So, to talk about Ragnarok in the Marvel Universe, we gotta address Thor. Thor is a superhero, like many others, like Hulk, for example. And um, it was uh, invented, created in 1962. This is the cover of the first uh, issue where uh, Thor was introduced, as you can see, introducing the mighty 
Thor, the most exciting superhero of all time, was created by Stanley, Larry, Lieber, and Jack Kirby. But why? Um, Stanley, in an interview given in 2002, tells us why. So they wanted to create someone stronger than the strongest person, but they didn't know what to pick. So it finally came to me, don't make this hero human, make him a god. So I decided readers were already pretty familiar with the Greek and Roman gods. So a, an issue which we already mentioned uh, in the 19th century, so concerning uh, the 19th century. Uh, so it might be fun to delve into the Old Norse legends. Besides, I pictured Norse gods looking like Vikings of old, with the flowing beards, horned helmets, and battle clubs. So, as you can see, we can definitely see the influence of 19th century medievalisms in this popular idea of Thor, which, um, you know, where many stereotypical uh, masculine attributes, you know, converge. So, muscles, corporeality, uh, of course, blonde, uh, Scandinavian-like um, uh, um, hair style, these winged helmets, which uh, you know stem from 19th century medievalisms, and a futuristic, um, futuristic armor, uh, and of course, his uh, uh, hammer Mjolnir. So, it's important to address Thor because some, uh, because one of the main uh, aspects of Thor's experience of Thor's story in the Marvel Universe is uh, his um, engagement, involvement in Ragnarok. But what is Ragnarok to in the Marvel Universe? So Ragnarok is an apocalypse, but it is not a single apocalypse. It is a destructive event that repeats all over again. So it has happened, already happened several times. It's going to happen several more times in the future. It is cyclical. And most interestingly, this destructive event produces energy. And this energy is actually the food of entities that are called those who sit above in the shadow. So they feed off the energy released by the destruction of the world of Asgard, the planet Asgard, and by the reincarnation of the gods and of the Asgardians. Very interesting idea of Ragnarok which is going to turn out to be useful later for us. So every deity has existed before, they have been destroyed, and then they uh, have reincarnated. But at some point in the saga, in the issue, the volumes 80, 85, uh, in August, December 2004, Thor finally decides to break the cycle of uh, Ragnaroks, of these destructions. Uh, finally, Odin takes this decision, and uh, well, to make a long story short, again, uh, Thor uh, uh, engages uh, Loki, challenges him, beheads him, so basically, uh, you know, defeats the uh, main uh, antagonist in this story. He also uh, defeats those uh, who sit above in the shadows, and is able to break once and for all this. A cycle of apocalypses. So the problem is to is basically solved, and then this um, branch of the story basically is put to a stop by the creators. Uh, Thor li literally decides to hibernate himself, and uh, you know this branch of the story like uh, stops there. But um, for what concerns? The, the other branch of the story, which you may have, uh, you know, uh, watched at the cinema a few years ago in 2017 uh, for the, um, uh, uh, during the broadcast of Thor Ragnarok, directed by Taika Waititi, something else happens. This is a different branch of the story, so uh, the, the two branches are not necessarily connected. So in this case, uh, Odin is uh, dying, and Hela, uh, so Thor's sister, um, you know, decides to take the power for herself. So um, Thor needs to stop her from taking power. Um, at the beginning of the story, you know, we know that um, Thor defeats Surtur. So basically, Thor prevents Ragnarok from happening. But 
Uh, during the movie, uh, Hela takes power, and Thor realizes that the only way he has to really stop Hela from taking more power is to actually use Ragnarok against her. So he can't defeat her by means of his um, hammer. He needs Ragnarok. He needs something bigger and more powerful. So he actually revives Surtur, and he reunites his Surtur's crown with the Eternal Flame, and uh, basically he brings about Ragnarok. So Ragnarok destroys Asgard, planet Asgard, destroys and kills Hela, but of course this means that the Asgardians need to migrate to another world. So Thor uh, finds a spaceship, a proper Ark of Salvation, and uh, you know manages to um, save all the Asgardians alongside himself and Loki, and bring all these people to a new planet, and in this case the planet is uh, Earth. So this is an example of, uh, again, which is very relevant for us, because this idea of leaving our planet to potentially in the future colonize another one uh, is not so far removed from, from what's happening nowadays. It's still, you know, far in the future, but not so far that we, uh, you know, associate it with um, sci-fi only. We are already talking about colonizing the moon, about colonizing Mars, because we are aware of the problem we're going to face in the near future. So in this case, Ragnarok has a little bit of a positive function because it helps Thor destroy a bigger threat. But, okay, horns in the background, uh, which signal the fact that I've been talking for an hour, so, okay, I'm, I'm getting closer to a conclusion, but not just yet. Um, so, I believe that these two branches of the story are, are very interesting in different ways. So the first branch, Marvel Comics, talk about the cyclicality of natural catastrophes. Again, this is not a far removed idea. If you think about geological frameworks, so frameworks in, in the field of geology. So uh, in geology, uh, there are two main traditions uh, to interpret what has happened uh, and what has actually prompted changes uh, on Earth. So on the one side, scholars believe uh, in uh, uniformitarianism or gradualism. So geological events and all changes occurred on Earth uh, have been, for the most part, very, very slow, very, very gradual in time, no major shocks, so to speak. On the other side, uh, since the 19th century, um, other scholars believed instead in uh, the role of catastrophic events, like, for example, the meteoritic impact that destroyed dinosaurs uh, more than 60 million years ago. So um, scholars who uh, adhere to the branch of catastrophism believe that the role of natural catastrophes have been way more important than uh, long-term gradual changes. Okay. And now, nowadays, this um, branch, catastrophism, uh, you know, is thriving, actually, starting from the 1970s and even more so nowadays, uh, uh, many among in the field of geology, but also in the field of archaeology, not only in these fields, uh, actually emphasize the, the, the role of uh, catastrophes in our very past. So this version of the story, this rereading of Ragnarok, is actually uh, sensible, consistent with what we uh, think we know about the past, even though we, we don't really know where the truth is, but we can always assume that the reality is probably in the middle. Okay. The second branch of this story um, in Thor Ragnarok, when we see uh, this migration to another planet and the survival of an entire population by migrating to another uh, planet, as I just said, um, is... is that resonates for us. It's not like it's not just sci-fi. We all are aware that that is a possibility. Um, think about a sci-fi movie which is also very realistic to a, a good extent, like Interstellar, which is a beautiful movie. And again, it's very science-based. That's exactly what. Um, the director addresses in this movie. So this need uh, in the in the future 
let's hope it's a distant future, the need that we might have and we may have to leave this planet to settle somewhere else. So as you can see, the same story, the same old, old story can, uh, you know, uh, uh, encourage us to uh, tell different experiences that may that we may um, uh, that we are familiar with, or, or that we may be familiar with, in the uh, not so distant future, maybe. Again, this is the powerful of the Ragnarok myth. That's why I don't think that's just a story. Uh, it's just it's more than than a simple story. Otherwise, it would not work so effectively. And then we cannot omit to mention a very recent TV series. Um, which you can uh, still find on Netflix and by the title Ragnarok, uh, which is entirely set in Norway in a beautiful little town uh, in a Norwegian fjord, uh, a town named, um, interesting, interestingly named Edda, uh, a beautiful town which uh, in itself is victim of climate change, like every other town in, in, in the world, by you know, for that matter, but in, in the case of Edda, uh, you know, in the town, we also find uh, high, high, heavy pollution due to the presence of uh, huge industries, which are owned by a family by the name of Util. So the Util Industries. Okay. So this is the main setting of the story. This is a sci fi series. Uh, but at the same time, it's a sci-fi series which addresses climate-related topics. So it's called a cli-fi series. Uh, what, uh, what are the sci-fi elements? Um, so we find a similar operations, operation uh, as the one that Antonia Bayat did in her um, beautiful novel, uh, but to a different level, like... The Edda and Old Norse mythology becomes a way to retell our own reality. So as I said, this story, this series is set in our modern days by the protagonists find out, slowly, gradually find out that they are reincarnations of the gods, of the Norse gods. So the protagonist, Magne, finds out he is Thor. And, um, you know, gradually everybody else, for example, his brother, Lauris, finds out he's Loki for obvious reasons. And uh, so, you know, as the story proceeds uh, forward, Magne finds out that the story of Ragnarok regards him very closely because Ragnarok is going to happen in his own very days, in our own very days. Because what has been recorded in Old Norse mythology is just a story it's just a story that's get, that gets repeated all over again. As the gods reincarnate, Ragnarok is going to re-happen again. So it's an interesting operation of you know, modernization of, uh, of the Ragnarok story to say that, again, the, apoc the apocalypse is just ahead of us and has been ahead of other societies uh, in the past. Just, by the way, has, uh, it has uh, been prophesied by the, by the Volva in uh, Volspa. The Volva says that uh, Ragnarok is going to happen. She's a prophetess. She sees the future, right? So in the story, there are three seasons, by the way. So the, the, you know, the, the series is now uh, finished, has been finished, um, has ended in uh, you know, last summer, August 2023, I believe. So it is a modernization of this uh, drama, an analogy with Old Norse mythology. There are many, many references to our modern society, for example, to woke culture. Uh, you know, this uh, one of the female protagonists, uh, Isolde, is like an analogy to Great, Greta Thunberg because she's a climate act activist that um, uh, turns out to be very important in, in the plot because she fights actively against the util industries and uh, for uh, pollution related uh, uh, issues, of course. And we find out that since Magna is Thor, since uh, Loritz is um, Loki, the Util industries uh, are representations and reincarnations of the Jötnar. So they are the giants, the multinational corporate giants that uh, fight against the gods and that 
uh, you know, threatened to to defeat them. So a crafty re reading of um, of this uh, story. Um, by the way, you might you might be wondering how does Laritz give birth to the Midgas Ormer? Uh, well, they find a, a very tricky solution. In fact, uh, Laritz, who is Loki, uh, actually gives rise to the Midgas, Midgas Ormer um, uh, in the guise of a tapeworm. And then he um, expels it, he feeds it, and then he releases it uh, in, into the sea for it to grow as much as it needs uh, to finally become very strong, powerful, and uh, and fight against Thor. Uh, now, just to find a conclusion to this whole story, uh, if you want to watch this story, be sure to mute your audio for the following 15 seconds because I'm going to tell you how the story ends. So, spoiler alert here. Okay, mute your audio now. Um, for those of you who already are familiar with the ending of the story, who, who are not going to watch this series, um, actually nothing of this is true, nothing of this is happening, because this turns out to be a figment of the imagination of Magne. Magne was a, has always been since a child, since he was a child, a very problematic, um, um, shy guy. He suffered from dyslexia, so he was not really able to integrate with his peers, and he found uh, at his home a comic series regarding Thor and Ornos mythology. So he delved into it. He, he dived into this uh, comic series and he started to like uh, make believe that he was one of them. And so he starts reading the reality around him as if he was actually Thor. But in reality, that's not going to happen. And in fact, the whole story is not really about Ragnarok, but is about the struggles of adolescence, of uh, growing up, uh, with ob obvious references to uh, you know climate related to climate change because the old story of the utility industries is true. So, actually, Isolde is an actual activist, and uh, she manages to uh, make the util industries change their politics concerning um, you know pollution, uh, but. Uh, more than that, this is a story about uh, growing up. And the final message is not pessimistic, as, um, for example, in the case of uh, Antonia Bayat's romance, a uh, novel, but it is more a story about, you know, us growing up, taking care of ourselves. Uh, of course, being preoccupied about what's, what happens around us, but starting with ourselves. So uh, let's be positive about the future. And I believe this is a, a useful um use of uh, of Ragnarok. Let, let's not always talk about destruction only, but also about, uh, let's not forget the idea of rebirth that is also addressed in that story. So, final part of this uh, of this talk. Let's uh, summarize some uh, um, things uh, up. Let me just take a sip. So, the day of the high walls is quite trendy nowadays. And especially in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, we can note that this story and the, the main warning inherent in that story uh, has uh, become relevant to us, so more and more relevant to us. We use the Ragnarok myth to understand more about ourselves, or at least to reflect a bit more about ourselves, and uh, if that is the mere use that, that we do, that we make of that story, that would be a victory already. I think this might not have been the first time that people have used this story to reflect upon themselves. This is just speculation, by the way, but many historians historians uh, address this side of the Ragnarok story. So you may know that important, massive uh, natural catastrophes have occurred during the Middle Ages and um, massive volcanic, volcanic eruptions, namely, uh, have occurred in 536 AD, then again in, uh, in the in 940s, then again in around the year 1000. These things happen in history. And uh, some historians, some archaeologists, some uh, uh, scientists, like these 
uh, scientists at the Department of Geosciences at the University of Oslo. This is, uh, I, I took this image from one of the project uh, called Vikings Volcanic Eruptions and their impacts on climate. Um, you know, think that the Ragnarok story uh, may be more than a story. They demonstrated that, uh, for example, in the year 535, 536, as you can see from Denver chronological evidence, you know, in 536 AD, pretty much nature stopped growing. And we know this same information uh, from many other trees all around the world, even in North America. We know that this um, catastrophe that was probably caused by a massive series of volcanic eruptions that probably took place in Iceland, uh, you know, um, like spread a thick veil of ash uh, that screened the sun uh, all over at least the northern hemisphere. And as a consequence of that, temperatures decreased a lot. And, you know, many things changed. Uh, actually, many contemporary uh, historical records like these ones that I listed here, from the west to the far east, recorded in those very years that something was going on, something weird was going on, like an eclipse, but it was not an eclipse, but the, the effects were similar. So the sun, the stars, the moon were screened by something that they didn't really know what it was. They noted that bodies did not project shadows, at least not neat shadows as they used to do in the past, that the weather was much worse, that crops failed. So all of these sources uh, tell the same stories. And, and then again, Denver chronology confirms that uh, in, those, in that year, uh, something very, very weird happened that uh, signaled that nature stopped growing pretty much. Um, again, this is speculation. We cannot really say that the Ragnarok myth was a way to tell the story, to reflect on this very catastrophe. But I just want to suggest that a myth like Ragnarok can be a way to uh, cope with a catastrophe like this one. Then we may say that the date of the age of this catastrophe, so the first, uh, the second quarter or the sixth century, could be coherent with the supposed uh, creation of these oral stories that uh, make up the bulk of the uh, Ragnarok myth, but we cannot have, uh, uh, we cannot find any evidence of it. But I want to encourage the, encourage you to to think about this possibility. What we know as for a fact is that other eruptions, other massive eruptions that are comparable to this 536 AD one, like an eruption that occurred in Peru in 1601 and an, another one that occurred in Indonesia in 1815 had very, very similar impact on nature on the world as the impact that I uh, just described to you uh, in re with reference to the 536 AD, like a dreadful impact for people and for the environment. So it's not far-fetched to, to imagine that um, a myth like Ragnarok might have been a way to cope with a disaster like this, but uh, it's fair to note that uh, even catastrophic events like the, like uh, you know the 1601 eruption uh, do not necessarily uh, prompt the creation of a disaster myth. There's no certain correlation between a disaster and a disaster myth. That's why we cannot really prove it. So I'm just suggesting the idea. By the way. Um, somehow, uh, art uh, historians believe that uh, Munch's uh, scream was influenced by another uh, eruption which had occurred in 1883, 84 in, uh, in uh, Indonesia again. So in Krakatoa, a vol volcano. And that's why the, the, the sky has those colors. And that's the reason behind the anguish of, of the protagonist, which is so you know, popular all around the world due to you know, it's um, a scary uh, uh, facial features. Uh, some artists also believe that uh, that uh, Munch was uh, um, like wanted to fix in time and in space the anguish that he himself uh, felt when he saw the sky changing colors and the environment changing accordingly uh, um, after the crocodile eruption. So these are just examples of contemporary sources addressing the 536 AD uh, eruption uh, from uh, great intellectuals of the time, like Procopius of Cassiodorus. I'm not going to delve into it again because this is 
just uh, speculation, but I think it is interesting to note um, consistencies between these uh, records, which are very realistic, and what we read in the Ragnarok myth. So the sun gave forth uh, its light without brightness, like the moon. Uh, it was like a sun eclipse, but it was not an eclipse because they, they knew what an eclipse was and they were sure that this was not uh, an eclipse. So crops failed and, uh, you know, um, the sun, uh, stars uh, seemed to have lost. They wanted light and appeared to have a blue, bluish color, etc., etc., etc. So a very strange, weird and uh, scary situation. In fact, I also um, spent a bit of time uh, trying to reconstruct uh, consistencies between, on the one side, uh, what we find in the um, Ragnarok and Fimbulvetham myth in uh, contemporary accounts and uh, in uh, scientific and material evidence from dendrochronology and archaeology, uh, etc. And um, again, we are in the field of speculation. I don't want to uh, convince you of this theory. By the way, I'm not even necessarily supporting the theory. I'm just, uh, I just want to note I'm more interested in telling you, pretty much, that myths can be, possibly can be a way to record disaster. Because stories such as a myth um, can be a very efficient way to record um, unexplainable events and give meaning, and give meaning to them, right? Also, these stories are very easy to remember and to pass down to future generations especially this is relevant for oral cultures, okay? So you, or you reconstruct a story around something and then you hand down the story with all the um, useful information. Anyways, um, this is not a far-fetched theory. I'm referring to the use of myths as um, like tools to, to remember things. Um, many other brilliant scholars, many brilliant scholars have... Uh, the same idea. Uh, Pernil Hermann, for example, in a recent contribution uh, about mythology in the Handbook of Promoting Nordic Memory Studies, stated that memory exists in the mythology just as mythology exists in memory. So, you know, the, the, each and every one serve the purpose of each other, right? And I perfectly agree with, with her position. Uh, in the very same volume, Matthias Nordvig propose the idea that actually the Ragnarok myth and specifically uh, Feuspau uh, may be the record of an actual eruption. He doesn't think it, it is uh, the eruption of 536 AD, but the Elgiao eruption of uh, the 930s, 940s, which uh, happened in Iceland and was as massive of uh, the 536 eruption. So he basically proposes my same uh, idea. But I could also quote one of the most uh, important anthropologists of uh, the last century, uh, Bronisław Malinowski, who said that myth, myth is neither a fictitious story nor an account of a dead past. It is instead a statement of a bigger reality still partially alive. And what I would try to show you is that the Ragnarok myth is indeed still partially alive in us, as if there's something more to it than a simple uh, story. In fact, there's many stories in all mythologies of the past about catastrophes like, uh, of course, the very famous deluge. And I find that Plato, um, when addressing in the Timaeus, uh, the real purpose of these stories, I find that he mentioned the most important aspect. So Plato was a was convinced of uh, he was a catastrophist pretty much we we might address him this way he was convinced that uh, natural catastrophes occurred cyclically in the world but there was a problem with this and the problem was that after each catastrophe human beings uh, would restart civilization all over again but they would make that same mistake all over again and that mistake is hubris they would forget again that catastrophe can happen and they would feel untouchable. So Plato says, you start all over again every time 
and regain your childlike state of ignorance about things that happened in ancient times both here and in your part of the world. That's why myths are important, because they teach future generations, maybe, okay, that's a possibility, to not forget that the world can be destroyed cyclically. So it's a very important message for a community. So Leif and Nefrazir are, you know, brothers and sisters of Deucalion and Pira and, uh, and uh, of Noah and uh, many others. So there's many, many of these stories and uh, I believe they had a very important function. So why is Ragnarok really relevant to us? Are we a society so different from medieval society? Uh, oh yeah, from, from many a perspective, yes, we're definitely different, from, but from many others, no. Uh, medieval society, a, a portion of medieval society, of course, believed in the aging of the world. So they were constantly expecting that the world would uh, end, right? Uh, aren't we? Don't, don't we do the same? Uh, Postmodern culture, uh, you know, has a very deep, profound sense of mistrust, not only in the present, but also in the future, as if everything good has already happened. And there's not much to do, uh, there's not much to, to our present, to our future. So in this sense, we are an age that awaits, uh, not eagerly awaits, but definitely expects uh, the end of the world, as if, you know, everything has already happened. So what else? And on the other hand, Look at the, uh, what the popular culture has, has produced in the last 50 years. Many movies and novels and uh, TV series, for that matter, have, you know, uh, encouraged us to, to, to become familiar with all sorts of catastrophes, like alien invasions and pandemics, zombie apocalypses, nuclear wars, environmental catastrophes, and asteroid impacts. And on many occasions in these stories, what happens? So when we are very unlucky, the, the world ends and that's it. But on many other occasions, um, there is a return to the Middle Ages. Not to the Middle Ages properly, but to an age or to a phase for humankind uh, characterized by wilderness, chaos, um, the lack of justice, social conflicts. This is the stereotypical ideas that people still nowadays associate with uh, with the Middle Ages. So it, it, from both, both these perspectives, uh, the Ragnarok myth is very relevant to us. And just think of, uh, or don't look up, a very recent uh, movie um, where uh, the, the, the asteroid finally um, impacts the Earth and destroys our civilization. But it's just to say that we are constantly thinking about that more and more. Don't forget that NASA or SpaceX, I think it was NASA, you know, uh, uh, funded that mission just um, very recently to 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 uh, correct the um, path of an asteroid that uh, uh, would have uh, probably impacted Earth in the, in, in the future. So we are actively working to uh, save us from what could happen in the future. So we are living in an age where Ragnarok is our bread and butter so to speak, our daily bread. So in conclusion, I believe that the reason why we still look back at Ragnarok more than at other myths is because we, maybe unconsciously, I don't know, we, we still grasp its very meaning. It is meaningful and it makes us remember that we should be more humble. Uh, that uh, whatever the progress we have achieved, whatever the uh, the 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 amazement we can feel about our uh, society, when we look at it from the bright side, uh, no matter what, we are still subject to 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 be annihilated in the space of a few seconds because uh, all sorts of things can still happen to us, even though we have for forgotten that. Especially, you know, in the a few decades ago, in the 1980s, 1990s, we not we were not really thinking about that. So maybe it is time for us to start thinking about 
uh, being a bit more humble again and that's why i believe that the ragnarok myth resonates for us Let, don't ever forget that the prophecy in uh made in, in uh, Voluspau refers to the future so the ragnarok uh, might have been a way to fix maybe a an eruption or a series of eruptions in 536 CD or in the 1940s or or you know uh, at, a, at uh, any other catastrophic event for that matter but um, in Voluspau it is a prophecy so it is yet to come it is a way to tell people don't think that the last time was actually the last time in fact uh, uh, back to to Vargas uh, he said that he saw the Ragnarok in uh, at dawn you know at the at dawn when the, the sun was riding and La Pesadilla in uh, his uh, nightmare so as if he was uh, actually expecting it um, thanks so much for for your attention Thank you so much, Professor Andrea Maraschi. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Are you listening to me? It's okay? Yeah, yeah. It's my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> we have some questions here. I will like I will go one one each time. Okay. We want uh, one more time. I will begin with the question of Professor Johnny Langer. Johnny Langer. The North Mix were initially reevaluated by modern reception after 1755 as heroic, glorious, nationalist, epic reference, and as a social identity. Yeah. In this context, at what point might Ragnarok have been separated from nationalist issues to a reflection on our concerns about environment and scatological fears? Okay, thanks, uh, Professor Langer. Uh, again, thanks for inviting me uh, in the first place. And uh, actually, thanks for uh, your academic production, your academic mm -hmm. works, which I read uh, enthusiastically. Um, uh, and a very interesting question. Um, I didn't find a proper like uh, time when things shift, because I believe that it's very hard um, to track all the uh, medievalisms or Ragnarok because they they may be many but on the basis of what I could uh, find meaningful I think that the use of Ragnarok not uh, in nationalistic terms but more uh, you know in for the purpose of uh, reflecting upon um, yeah eschatological fears as you as you said the environment that's a very very recent uh, phenomenon in my opinion um, as I said uh, during my, my lecture, this thing has started to resonate, uh, in, uh, you know, concerning environmental issues only in the last uh, 15 years, as far as I could uh, as I could find. Again, I could have probably missed some other important uh, references to Ragnarok and to Fimbledetter, but I I made sure to check uh, pretty much everywhere, in, in, even in... Uh, video games and uh, movies, TV series. And uh, in my opinion, it's a very, very recent phenomenon. Uh, and it's, it doesn't surprise me, to be honest. It doesn't surprise me because um, until 15 years ago, or, or certainly in the very, at the very beginning of the 21st century, I was a, t a teenager at the time. Uh, we certainly heard, uh, you know discourses about uh, about the environment but uh, they were not as um you know uh constantly present in our daily lives and i believe that when they started becoming a, a more cogent issue in the 2010s that's when the ragnarok myth started to be reinterpreted but I, again i could be wrong so if you guys have uh evidence that this um phenomenon started earlier i'll will be very happy to, to learn more from from you <laughs> Thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. Another question for also Johnny Langer. <laughs> and how do you analyze Klaus Hauck's interpretation that some bracketize from uh, 4050 and 55 Anno Domini could contain images of the death of God, the god Baldr 
Ragnarok. Yeah, this is a this is an intriguing aspect of this story, which I didn't have the time to to address. But yeah, what what Professor Langer is referring to um, is the fact that uh, many bracteids have been found uh, that um, are uh, that had had been interred in a space of time that is coherent, partly partially with the uh, with the time of that um, uh, massive series of volcanic eruptions around the 520s uh, 530s 540s uh, actually during the, the the preceding century as well um i believe that it that you know unfortunately when it comes to um these kinds of uh, archaeological findings you cannot really find a uh, you cannot really date them uh, ad annum so you can't really say they were interred uh, at the time of the eruption. So, as, as Professor Langer stated, in that case, uh, historians and archaeologists believe that uh, uh, people were like preoccupied uh, by, in that time, more generally about an apocalypse, and they might have been prompted to uh, inter these um, brackets, which refer to Baldur, so to the beginning of Ragnarok. So that could be a, a link between the imagery in those brackets and the beginning and, and an actual Ragnarok, because they were uh, scary about a natural catastrophe. But it's very hard to prove it. So my position is that uh, it may very well be the case. It may well be the case because uh, historical records concerning the um, 536 uh, eruptions are very, very strong. And that doesn't always happen. So for example, the um, as far as I know, the other massive, massive volcanic eruption that I uh, mentioned, the Elgao eruption, uh, as far as I know, was not recorded so extensively by, by contemporary historians. There, there have been other events uh, that uh, scared people and scared chroniclers but uh, as I said, not necessarily every disaster elicits a disaster myth. The fact that the 536 eruption like, uh, was witnessed by so many people and that these records are so consistent and that, in, uh, that so many brackets with that imagery concerning Baldur's death you know, are a clear hint at that myth, uh, I'm more on the side of those who think that that may well be the case. Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know what, what's your opinion about it, uh, but um, yeah, I think that's, that's that's a possibility. That's a strong possibility. I'm sure if you send me an email to Johnny, he will reply to you with a long text explaining. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that uh, that uh, he has addressed these aspects in a beautiful uh, uh, article about the wolf's jaw. So um, I know I know a bit of of his position, of course, but. Um, Specifically, uh, I, I don't remember what uh, what his opinion is about uh, the brackets. Now, I have two questions from uh, Pro Professor Luciana Campos. Uh, they are about your research and food mainly. Yeah. Uh, the first question is: You is it's not in the private session in private, not in the the chat. Okay. Uh, you uh, publicized an article in the Scandi magazine where you analyzed the passage from Eric Saga. Uh, the, the, that dish that is prepared for for Bung uh, to eat uh, before making his prophecy. This dish is made with hearts of animals found in the site. Is there evidence of the existence of this dish? If so, was it so just ritually or a dish for festive feasts? There's no evidence for any dish like that. Um, so my main problem was to justify why uh, it was structured that way that's a very peculiar recipe as you as you reminded so it's the hearts the hearts of all the animals that were living in the area so basing on the fact that th there's no evidence of that at least uh, to my knowledge uh, the only thing that i really could do is starting from the premise why the hearts what is the meaning of the heart in that culture and again very different to find evidence of this but um, then if you like widen your scopes a little bit, uh, you can find out that even in the Old Norse Corpus only, um, and mostly in Fornada Sugu for obvious reasons, because these sort of recipes are kind of gruesome. So 
you don't necessarily you don't find them in in uh, Icelandic family sagas, of course. So they they pertain to the domain of legends of the past. But there are some hints of the use of hearts. So think about the uh, Fafnir's heart, of course, that uh, allows Sigurdur to to understand the language of birds. So that that was a culture, at least within within a literary context but i believe that it was not a literary context it was a more a broader cultural religious context that had very ancient origins anyways that was a culture that uh, associated with the heart certain powers so when you eat the heart of an animal or of a human being you get specific properties or qualities that come with the heart itself so to me it's a sort of uh with all inverted commas a magical meal. I wouldn't call it magical because it's seder, so it's a different thing. Uh, it's magic, but it's seder, so <laughs> it's a very, very specific kind of magic. Uh, but uh, so to to to, re to reply shortly, no evidence uh, of uh, any dish from archaeological you know, remains, for example, or from other sources, but strong evidence that um, hearts were deemed to um, to um, host powers that could be transferred and that's um, a very very common literary motif uh, not only in iceland and in the sagas but also uh, everywhere else in in europe so i we, we got to work with many many um gaps many um you know uh, holes in information we got to try and and find patterns so that's the pattern that i that i found that made sense to me at least no, no, it was great. It was great. <laughs> and and uh, second question, uh, you recently published a book on the history of food in the Middle Ages. As a researcher, she is on how to how do you see uh, uh, sorry, sorry, you as a researcher, how do you see this great appeal of producing authentic medieval food uh, in the restaurants and parties? And how do you see the role of experimental food archaeology all right so i am enthusiast myself um i have <laughs> you're a chef uh, um i'm not a chef. i'm very uh, despite <laughs> being italian i'm very bad uh, at cooking but i'm very um gluttonous <laughs> so to speak uh no i'm lucky enough to be a food historian firstly so uh, i work as i as a consultant for a few especially one very very philologically based uh, uh, reconstruction company here in Italy they like really study um, uh, recipes uh, from actual sources and they uh, try and recreate them with the utmost respect for what could have been the uh, culinary ideas of the past and when I do that experience that's amazing uh, they I like eat the way it was supposed to you know i was supposed to eat in the past so i eat with my hands and i share bread with other people so it's a beautiful experience so i encourage you to 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 try the same experience if you find serious reconstructing reconstruction companies that's a problem though with uh, these um reconstructions we'll never know we cannot re replicate the taste and even if we could replicate the taste, assuming that we can find the right ingredients, which are not the same ingredients that they used to use in the past, we could never replicate the experience. Because when we when we eat something that has been reconstructed um, with the utmost respect for ingredients and um, cooking and everything, we eat that dish with our own palate. But our own palate is... Um, used to completely different flavors nowadays. Uh, this depends on the country where you live. Some countries like um, Scan you know, Scandinavian countries, Germany, North Africa, they still have a cuisine that kind of resembles uh, you know, medieval cuisine, for example. In Italy, in France, we totally changed that, uh, that structure of the, of the meal and those flavors. So we, I could never know what they thought when they would eat something. But um, other than that, I think uh, it's, a, it's a pretty useful operation because um, we cannot really sense anything about the past. We maybe can try to recreate the music of the past, okay? We can, uh, you know, visit these places like these beautiful cathedrals and everything. 
And uh, with food, we have this privilege of at least having a grasp of what this food tasted like. So I think it's an interesting operation to get a glimpse of what it really was. So as long as it, as it, uh, it is done, uh, uh, you know, with all the um, serious uh, methodologies uh, uh, and, um, you know, sources are respected and uh, the right ingredients are found and, uh, um, you know, it's a beautiful experience, to be honest. I, I would uh, advise everybody to, to try it out. So if you come to Italy, so if you're planning to come to Italy, be sure to contact me and I will point you at this place in Italy, which is exactly in central Italy, in Umbria, where they every uh, summer they uh, rearrange a medieval banquet uh, based on, uh, you know, actual recipes, and it's amazing. So... It's one of the very few tools that we have to get a grasp of what uh, was uh, like in the past. But <laughs> you know, one of the things that my my mentor uh, taught me, uh, Professor Massimo Montanari, uh, one of the leading experts in food history, uh, I, I remember one day asking him, "Can we really understand what what was like to be to live in the Middle Ages?" And he, he looked at me and he told me, okay, think about this. They didn't know the Beatles. So, I didn't know the Beatles. The Beatles are like, we all know what the Beatles are. You know, like many other bands, but they specifically have been so influential in our culture. So, think about these people and never heard about them. And, you know, never heard about many, many other things. And we, never heard about many things that were relevant to them so yeah thank you so much thanks so much thank you. Uh, now we have another question from leandro vilar uh, leandro vilar say uh, professor maraski the movie thor ragnarok gave the event a comical tone in your opinion would this be the result of a parody or an attempt to soften controversial topics such as apocalypse <laughs> yeah nice question <clears throat> well <laughs> i don't i'm not a fan of the, uh, despite being a nerd myself as i as i told as i told andre uh, uh, <laughs> before uh, so i'm into many many things like uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering. So I really respect that, you know, universe in general of these medievalism, these modern medievalism. I'm not uh, really a fan of uh, the Marvel Universe. Just that, That's just my uh, personal taste. I watched the movie just because I had to, to be honest, because, <laughs> <laughs> because I was doing this research. So I forced myself to watch it and I found it uh, with all due respect, I found it appalling because I can't really, um, I can't really, <laughs> it's hard to talk about it because I don't want to sound offensive, but you know, a movie where I see Hulk and when I see Thor looks weird to me. So to answer briefly to your question, that looks a parody to me, uh, three, uh, you know, in, in all regards. So it, but I don't want to be this superficial either. Um, it is a parody because it's the main purpose of this of those movies is to entertain. Uh, they don't want to really help you reflect upon things, unless you uh, you are like passionate about these topics yourself, like, like myself, for example. And then you can actually see that parody can also be useful. Like, don't look up. For example, I, I mentioned that movie for that very reason. That's a very parodic um, attempt to to um, uh, to describe our society, but still, it's very useful because it tells a, a very useful story that a catastrophe might happen tomorrow, and we could be busy on TikTok and and we don't, we don't notice it. Uh, so I would say that's a parody, but even parody can be useful. And uh, in my own small way, I found it useful to. To um, I mean, I think that it, it that it throws an important message that that's one of the things that might happen to us. This idea of migrating. So let's leave aside the entertainment side for for a moment. That's a story that um, it's not so far fetched. Uh, so even though I would not encourage you to watch the movie because Interstellar is better to to in all regards, 
but to some extent it's not so different than uh, than interstellar so why not uh, give it a chance okay let's see if you have another question uh, more relevant to this the conference uh we have general questions probably you already talked about uh let me see uh over here now 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 if you uh, don't find any other question about the the uh, exactly about the conference so i'm gonna take a row and ask you a question uh, it's not exactly about the Ragnar, but but your framework at the moment with your researchers. Are you going to the theoretical field of environment history, or do you're planning to continue in the food history, or are you just traveling always, all the ways? All um, the I'm not actively uh, investigating the environment, uh, environmental history, to be honest. So this was one of the uh, of a series of like three or four papers that I wrote on the topic, um, but just because it uh, you know intersected my interest uh, in uh, in old Norse mythology in uh, in uh, old Norse material in general. But uh, usually that's not uh, I'm not too concerned with that aspect. So uh, in in the last uh, couple of years, two three years, I, I've been writing more about magic. Uh, I'm, I'm not a kind of scholar who like focuses on just a couple of topics. I, I like experimenting a lot, and uh, my love of the moment is uh, definitely magic and uh, things you eat to to have special powers uh, to to uh, absorb uh, magical qualities and, and the likes. So not not really much into environment, to be honest. Uh, thanks so much for your answer. Thank you. uh, Okay, I think we are finished here. I would like to thank you so much for your exposure. Thank you so much you. for your conference. It was a great experience having you here. It was my pleasure. And, and now I will finish my words with in Portuguese for the persons listening. Uh, obrigados a todos e todas estarem aqui presentes. Convidamos a quem desejar e quem puder comparecer à tarde para a nossa segunda etapa de comunicações. E tenham um ótimo dia e até mais. Tchau, tchau.